Okay, folks, let's get started. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, Professor. Oh, I hear some hissing. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble here, aren't I? How are you guys doing? The microphone is working so far. Hopefully, it'll work today. So we'll see how that goes. So, All right. So um, somebody pointed out to me that on the highlights, it says you don't have to know the structures, and it says you have to know the structures. So what do you say? We just flip a coin. I need to change that on the highlights. So point number nine, where it says you have to know the structures, I'm not going to make you know the structures. So you guys should feel good. Last year, I made them memorize the structures. So, but you might be saying, well, maybe, you know, the people last year will be ahead of me now because, but you wouldn't think that, would you? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, well, last time I got started talking about the citric acid cycle, and uh, today I'm going to finish the citric acid cycle and talk a little, a little bit about regulation of the cycle. And then I'm going to talk about another related cycle. So that's my sort of plans for the day and see how that all goes about. So there's some things I'm talking about and I'll keep talking about, like the electron transport system, like oxidative phosphorylation, that we will talk about soon. So um, if it, I keep bringing them up and bringing them up, it's because they are important, but um, the things relative to those, don't worry too much about them until I start actually talking about those two cycles. So um, let's get started with the cycle that we've got here. So last time uh, when I uh, was done, I finished uh, by talking about the um, formation of isocitrate. And um, the formation of isocitrate is catalyzed by the enzyme, uh, by the enzyme aconitase. And um, as I pointed out, that uh, enzyme is poisoned by the substrate uh, citrate synthase. Okay. Uh, bah, citrate, I can't even say it, fluorocitrate. Right? And that fluorocitrate comes about if an organism has eaten some fluoroacetate because citrate synthase makes fluorocitrate and fluorocitrate uh, makes, uh, or fluorocitrate actually poisons the aconitase enzyme. So that was an important consideration that, uh, from uh, an ecological uh, perspective back in the um, uh, 60s and 70s in particular. Um, now we turn our attention to the next reaction which is catalyzed by the enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase. And one of the things I hope that you learn in listening to the enzyme names is the enzyme names for the rest of the way will tell you really what's being catalyzed. What's the reaction that's being catalyzed? So in this case, isocitrate is the substrate. A dehydrogenase <coughs> will always be involved in an oxidation reaction. Okay? So this is an oxidative decarboxylation. All right? This is an oxidative decarboxylation. The one we talked about previously is an oxidative decarboxylation in two steps. The first step, decarboxylation, then oxidation. Here the two occur simultaneously. And in most places in biology, the oxidative decarboxylation does, in fact, occur simultaneously. That occurs here as well. Well, since we have an oxidation, we have electrons that have to be dealt with. <coughs> Excuse me. And those electrons are transferred to NAD to make NADH. The product of uh, that um, reaction, by the way, your, your uh, textbook is very fond of intermediates. And we're not going to worry about the intermediates, okay? Because they just add another level of complexity. And I find they add another level of complexity when I'm grading it as well. I'll say, what's the product of the reaction of isocitrate dehydrogenase? And somebody will put oxaloxacinate, which would be correct, okay, as an intermediate. But then the TA see it, and they haven't seen this. They don't know what that is, and they count it wrong, okay? So um, it's important, obviously, that we just sort of ignore the uh, intermediates uh, here because they're not really telling us much. Isocitrate um, decarboxylation produces a five carbon molecule known as alpha ketoglutarate. Okay? So we started with a six carbon molecule. We lose one carbon through decarboxylation. Um, that carbon dioxide is coming off right here, and we make alpha ketoglutarate. Okay? This is a fairly straightforward reaction. Um, and in fact, there's only really two reactions 
in all of the citric acid cycle where I will have any concern about you knowing the level of energy of the, of the reaction. Okay? One of them I've already told you so far, that was the citrate synthase, which I said was very energetically favorable in the forward direction. I haven't given you the other one yet. But this reaction is favorable. It produces NADH, and NADH is used later to make ATP. Well, right hot on the heels of one oxidative decarboxylation follows the second oxidative decarboxylation of the citric acid cycle, and that is the reaction here catalyzed by the enzyme <coughs> excuse me, known as alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And it's this enzyme that I talked about in the highlights that is very, very closely related to the uh, enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase <coughs> that we talked about on, uh, on uh, Monday. Okay? Now, um, I pointed out, and somebody asked me this morning, in fact, uh, what is an alpha-keto acid? Because I pointed out in the highlights that both alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase and pyruvate dehydrogenase work on alpha-keto acids. Okay? So alpha-keto acids have a structure, a general structure that looks like this. They have a carboxyl group at position one. And at position two, they have a keto group. Okay? So this is the alpha carbon. So it's alpha-keto acid. That's what we refer to as an alpha-keto acid. If we had pyruvate, <clears throat> it's also an alpha-keto acid because it has carboxyl, ketone, and then a methyl group here, a CH3. So structurally, alpha-ketoglutarate, <clears throat> wait, got the congestion today. Structurally, alpha-ketoglutarate and pyruvate both have, they're both alpha-keto acids, they both look identical at the top, okay? And it's not surprising that the enzyme that catalyzes the, the uh, reaction here uh, on uh, alpha-ketoglutarate is very, very similar in structure and mechanism to pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's working on a very, very similar molecule. Now, this reaction does not <clears throat> have a shortcut in bacteria. For example, they can't bypass that decarboxylation. The decarboxylation and the oxidation go together here. This enzyme is similar, though, in structure. It's similar in function, and it's also similar in mechanism. So it uses all five of the coenzymes that I talked about last time. Okay? So pyruvate dehydrogenase, I said, used five coenzymes. This guy uses five coenzymes. And the coenzymes <clears throat> are TPP, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, or CoA as we refer to it, NAD, and FAD. That's the five coenzymes, and this enzyme uses those guys also. Now, alpha-ketoglutarate is a, uh, an interesting intermediate in this cycle, and the reason it's an interesting intermediate, as we shall see, is because alpha-ketoglutarate can be very easily made into the amino acid glutamic acid. All we have to do is replace that oxygen with an amine group, and we have, an, we have glutamic acid. Okay? There's, a, there's a couple of intermediates <clears throat> in the citric acid cycle that have that property. This is one of those. And that also means that, alpha that, alpha that uh, glutamic acid can readily be made into, what happened here? Did I skip a thing? I'm sorry. I'm, I'm showing you succinate. Oh, OK, yeah, I'm sorry. But we make succinate. I'm, I'm <clears throat> now I'm getting lost. I can't blame it on cold medication today. It's just, just empty headedness is all it is. Um, alpha ketoglutarate, which is over here, uh, can, uh, in fact, be um, made from glutamic acid very readily as well. So we can make this into glutamic acid. We can make glutamic acid into it. And that means, then, that we can take amino acids and use them as energy sources. Okay? So protein is an energy source. If you're on a high-protein, low-carbohydrate diet, you can use amino acids to get energy very readily. Okay? So energy is not a problem when you're on a high-protein diet. All right. So alpha-ketoglutarate catalyzes a decarboxylation. The decarboxylation of alpha-ketoglutarate yields succinyl-CoA. Uh, and succinyl-CoA is now a four-carbon molecule. You'll notice we just put a CoA on there. What did we say about the CoA that we did um, before, when we had a CoA on uh, a reaction earlier? What was, that? what was the significance of that CoA? It was an activated intermediate. Activated intermediates have to have high energy. Okay? It's a high energy bond, so we have to have high energy to make a bond to the CoA. Where does the energy come from to make this bond? 
oxidation, oxidation, oxidation. Okay, this is an oxidation reaction. And so the oxidation of the uh, alpha ketoglutarate produces enough energy to make that high energy bond that's right here for the succinyl CoA. Okay? Question? Stephanie? Is the alpha ketoglutarate the enzyme? The enzyme is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This is alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Alpha ketoglutarate is the substrate. Yes? It's an organic compound. It's fairly complicated. I, let me, I'll show, pull up the structure here for you. Uh, it is folic acid, decarboxylation. Um, no, that's not it. Oh, my transfer reaction schematic. Oh, I don't think. Nope, that's not it. I, sh I had it on here yesterday. I can't remember the place where it was located. That's not it. Anybody know the, the figure? It's up. Okay, that's the problem. Uh, here we go. So the CoA is everything except the red stuff. It's a big honking organic molecule. Now, CoA uh, has as its root ADP. We talked just briefly about this last term. I said ADP was involved in so many things. There's ADP right there. And this is a side chain uh, that is linked to that, that that makes the rest of the molecule. But ADP is the base of the um, coenzyme A. This is a, it's called a thioester. This is a thioester. And thioesters have high energy, which is why when you see a CoA linked to something it has, it's basically an activated intermediate. OK? OK. All right. So um, let's see, back to where I was. I've just made um, succinyl CoA. OK. All right, so I've got a high energy intermediate. That high energy intermediate now we can think of as being useful for some purpose. And we see the purpose of that arising in the next reaction. And the next reaction is this guy right here. Okay, succinyl CoA with that high energy bond. Okay, the breaking of that bond yields energy. The energy is used to put a phosphate onto GDP. So technically, it's not an intermediate because it's not donating part of itself to something else. But there's a high energy bond, just as if it's a high energy intermediate or an activated intermediate. The product being succinate and the um, GTP. Notice that CoA is given off at that point because, of course, you've broken the bond between the succinate and the CoA at that point. Now, this enzyme has a, a enzyme. This reaction has a puzzling enzyme name. All right? But not really. The enzyme name is succinyl CoA synthetase. Succinyl CoA synthetase. Why do you suppose the enzyme was named that? What's that? Synthetase, uh huh. Any guesses? Yeah. So any reaction is reversible, and when they named the enzyme, they were studying the reverse reaction. Okay, so they were studying the reaction going from right to left, and they said, "Oh, we found the enzyme that makes succinyl CoA, so we'll call it succinyl CoA synthetase." Well, of course, that was before they had the fullness of the citric acid cycle going on. They wouldn't really realize what the whole wheel was doing. And so they named it according to what the one reaction was they were studying, which was the backwards reaction of the uh, citric acid cycle. So the enzyme name is succinyl CoA synthetase. This is the only place in the cycle where a triphosphate is directly made. And I hope you remember from last term when I told you that when we directly make a triphosphate, we have a specific type of phosphorylation. We give it a name. That name is, we call it substrate level phosphorylation. This is the only substrate level phosphorylation that occurs in the citric acid cycle. Okay. So the citric acid cycle is a very good cycle at oxidizing things and at storing that oxidative energy. It's actually storing it in the form of electron carriers. So we're making a lot of electron carriers in this cycle. The energy of those electron carriers will ultimately be used to make ATP. We don't see it here because it's not produced directly in this cycle. 
OK, questions about this? OK. The next reaction is uh, the, uh, and there's the synthase, there's the, the enzyme itself. And by the way, synthase and synthetase, I use those terms interchangeably. So uh, I think your book calls it synthetase. Other places you may see it called synthase. I, and though there's a technical difference between them, we will use those terms interchangeably. OK, well, the last reactions of the cycle are all bunched together on this figure. I'm not real keen about that, but I don't get to make the figures for the book. So uh, here we are. The first reaction is, um, uh, the first of the next reactions is the oxidation of succinate. So we have yet another oxidation going on. If you recall when I talked yesterday about the, uh, or not yesterday, on, on Wednesday about the cycle, I said the first part of the cycle was breaking down the six carbon intermediate to a four carbon intermediate. We're now at the four carbon intermediate. The second part of the cycle, I said, was converting that four carbon intermediate back to oxaloacetate. And that's we're in the, what we're in the process of doing. That takes a couple of oxidations in order for us to do that. And if you learn what happens in these couple of oxidations, you actually give yourself a leg up when we start talking about oxidations of fatty acids in a couple of weeks. Okay? The reason being that the same uh, mechanism is used to oxidize fatty acids as is used to oxidize succinate. Okay? Now I'm going to step you through that so you can see what happens. But I'll remind you when we go to talk about oxidation of fatty acids that you've seen this mechanism before. Okay? Succinate, look at this, four carbons. Doink, 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 doink. Single bonds everywhere. It's a very straightforward molecule. Yes, sir? Is primary um, an intermediate or is there a full? Nope. These are, these are full, these are not intermediates. These are actually, that's a good question. These are actually actual products of each reaction. So, yes, you do need to know each one of these. Okay? That's why I don't like putting all those intermediates on there. It confuses people in terms of, is this a, is this a product or is this an intermediate? But these are all uh, products of each reaction. OK. Um, all right, so we have a very straightforward molecule. We have to oxidize it. Well, to oxidize it, we've got to remove electrons. And removing electrons from this guy is not real easy. OK? Removing electrons from a saturated molecule like this is not easy. That takes a special. Uh, electron carrier that is capable of extracting electrons that are fairly tightly held. You saw one of these before. It was FAD. Here's FAD actually helping to extract these electrons. So the electrons are pulled away from this single bond here. That results in creation of a double bond. The product is FADH2. This is an oxidation because electrons have been lost by the succinate. And fumarate is the product of that. Now, in fatty acid oxidation, exactly the same thing happens. It not only happens in this step, it also happens in this step, and it also happens in this step. Okay? So if you learn these three steps, you've already learned fatty acid oxidation. You get two for the price of one. Well, fumarate is, oh, and the enzyme that catalyzes um, uh, this reaction is called fumarase. Okay? Fumarase. And um, don't really have... Um, no, I'm sorry. I, I said that fumarase. It's not fumarase. Sorry. Fumarase is this enzyme. This enzyme is called succinate dehydrogenase. Sorry. Again, dehydrogenase, we're talking about an oxidation reaction. So succinate dehydrogenase is the one enzyme of the citric acid cycle that's not dissolved in the matrix. It's actually embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This enzyme is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. That will become important later when we talk about the electron transport system because that enzyme plays a role in the electron transport system. All right. So succinate dehydrogenase produces this, and we get fumarate. Notice fumarate has a trans double bond. We'll see that trans double bond appearing in fatty acid oxidation as well. OK. Well. Fumarate, uh, to convert that double bond um, into something else, we add water to it. You remember from organic chemistry that reaction occurring as such. That reaction is not an oxidation. Adding water doesn't oxidize anything. So it simply puts an OH on one of the carbons, and it puts a hydrogen on the other carbon. That's the two parts of the water molecule that we've added. That enzyme is known as fumarase. Okay? So fumarase 
converts fumarate into this molecule we know as malate. And some people call it malate, and that's fine too. Good question. Will that happen without, without uh, an enzyme? The answer is it will to some extent. The enzyme, again, simply speeds the process. That's all it's doing. Yep. But you're right. That double bond will uh, be susceptible to uh, some water uh, addition. Not at a, a high enough level to, that's necessary, though. OK, so here's malate. Malate now has a, a hydroxyl on carbon number two. That hydroxyl is a dandy place to do some oxidation. And in fact, that's exactly what happens in the next step. So that hydroxyl in the next step gets oxidized to a ketone. We've now made, look at this, an alpha keto acid again. Exaloacetate is an alpha keto acid. The enzyme that catalyzes this last reaction is called malate, dehy is, it's called malate dehydrogenase. Okay? So again, it's an oxidation. That means we've got NAD going to NADH. And this is a very, very unusual oxidation. It looks straightforward. We see these kinds of oxidations occurring frequently with enzymes. That is, a hydroxyl group gets converted to a ketone. So what's unusual about it? What's unusual about it is that this reaction is not very energetically favorable. Here's the other reaction that you need to know something about its energy. It's not very energetically favorable, meaning if I start with equal concentrations of malate and exaloacetate, when I have equilibrium, I'm going to end up with a lot more malate than I am exaloacetate, meaning this reaction does not go very far forward at all. So how can the cell have something that doesn't go very far forward as part of a critical cycle? If you remember the very first reaction, exaloacetate got converted into citrate, and I said that was a very energetically favorable reaction. That reaction pulls this one. It pulls it. Okay. So the combination of the energetically favorable citrate synthase reaction with the energetically unfavorable uh, malate dehydrogenase reaction makes this overall process energetically favorable. And it's all due to that pulling that occurs thanks to that citrate synthase reaction. Now we begin to see why that activated intermediate was so important. Without that activated intermediate, we didn't have all that energy to help drive that first reaction forwards. So that activated intermediate is really helping the overall citrate cycle to occur. Without that, we would be not producing nearly as much uh, product in the cycle as we do. OK, now, there's probably more mechanism and more molecules there than you want to be thinking about. Uh, we have reached the end of that. At least uh, we have closed the circle, as it were. Maybe I should say that instead of ending it. Okay. The citrates, uh, um, the citric acid cycle is, as I said, a critical cycle for us. To summarize what we've done in this cycle is, as I've said before, we made three NADHs. We made one FADH2. We made one GTP. And that was for one acetyl-CoA. We get two acetyl-CoAs per glucose. So we can see that we've made a lot of NADH and FADH2 and GTP when we go to oxidize glucose. OK. Blah, blah. There's the reactions all in one place for you. People like that? That's good. And there's the summary of all the energies and so forth. Look at this guy, malate dehydrogenase, plus 29.7. Look at the citrate synthase, minus 31.4. It's a darn good thing that first reaction is very negative. Otherwise, you don't have a citric acid cycle. OK. Um, now, that's the cycle. Now, one of the things you're going to find some relief about is regulation of the cycle is really simple. Okay? I've said that before, and you guys think I'm a liar, but this is really simple. Okay? I promise you this time it's very simple. Regulation.
regulation of the cycle is very similar to the regulation or the potential regulation of glycolysis. But glycolysis had a lot of complicating factors. It had allosteric enzymes. And though your book depicts some of the enzymes in this cycle as being activated or inhibited by various compounds, the reality is it's not very allosteric in its regulation. So what regulates this cycle? It's very, very simple. NAD and FAD. If you remember those two things about the regulation of the cycle, you basically understand the regulation of the citric acid cycle. There are other things that play minor roles. We're not going to worry about them. NAD and FAD. What do we have to have to have NAD and FAD? We have to have oxygen, right? We'll talk about that when we talk about electron transport. You'll understand why that's the case. But in order to have NAD and FAD, we have to have oxygen. If this cell that is going through um, burning up a lot of energy runs out of oxygen, its citric acid cycle is going to stop very quickly. Because without NAD, it cannot make, I mean, it cannot keep the cycle going. You can imagine we stop the cycle very quickly with that. All right? And that does happen. The problem is that we cannot get NAD from the cytoplasm. We can get NAD in the cytoplasm if we do what? If we do fermentation. But fermentation will only get that NAD back to glycolysis in the cytoplasm. We can't get that NAD into the mitochondrion. It's for this reason that fermentation is so important for cells. Because at that point, when they have run out of oxygen, the only energy they have is coming from that glycolysis that's running in the cytoplasm. Okay? Well, as we talked about last term, glycolysis in the cytoplasm generates you two ATPs per glucose. Glycolysis plus citric acid cycle gives you 38 ATPs per glucose. Big difference. You haven't seen those ATPs yet. You'll see how they come later. So if a cell wants to stay alive, it's got to burn 19 times as much glucose to stay alive. That's why the Cori cycle is so important. For, an ener for a muscle that's rapidly metabolizing and it doesn't have enough energy, if it had to rely on fermentation to stay alive, it would be dead before too long. How do you know that? Well, you know that if you put a plastic bag over your head and you tie it. <laughs> now there's a question for you. Why do you die if you tie a plastic bag over your head? And you die fairly quickly if you do that. But I'm telling you that your cells can go without oxygen and you've got the Cori cycle to keep you alive. Why does tying a plastic bag over your head kill you? Any thoughts? <laughs> I want to think about this from an energy perspective, but you're right. Yes, sir. CO2 is a factor, but that's, all, that's also something I'm going to describe. There's another factor that's at play here. Shannon? The Cori cycle requires oxygen in the liver. You tie the bag over your head. Now you've depleted your body's supply of glucose. Okay? The Cori cycle can't be dumping out that glucose forever. And as a consequence, what was keeping everything else going isn't available anymore. You're hosed. Okay? So it's okay to go uh, anaerobic in a part of your system as long as you have a liver supplying everybody else. You cut that off, you're in trouble. Okay. Um, that's really informative, isn't it? Okay. The um, pyruvate dehydrogenase is regulated by phosphorylation. Okay. Now, remember the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is not a part of the citric acid cycle. It controls entry of acetyl-CoA into the citric acid cycle and phosphorylation by our friend protein kinase A stops that reaction. Okay? A phosphatase reverses it and makes active pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay. Oh, we don't want to go through that. Now, this is where the book has some relatively minor factors that will contribute 
to your confusions. I'm only going to show them to you just so that you don't get confused. I'm not going to hold you responsible for minor factors, all right? What happens here? Low ATP, um, I'm sorry, ATP, high ATP will turn this guy off. From an energy perspective, this makes sense. Do we want to have the citric acid cycle going if we have plenty of ATP? No, because citric acid cycle is going to make more ATP. That sort of makes sense. ATP is going to turn it off. Too much acetyl-CoA is going to stop the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction because duh, acetyl-CoA is a product of the reaction. Okay? Accumulating product is going to stop the reaction. No surprise. NADH is going to stop the reaction because duh, again, NADH is a product of the reaction. So these all make really good sense. Um, ATP and NADH, same story here. We don't want the reaction going if we have high ATP levels. NADH is a product of this reaction. Same thing. NADH, product of this reaction. Same thing. Yes, sir? Is too much ATP a waste of energy or can that be toxic? To my knowledge, it can't be toxic. Uh, no. But what we will see is uh, when we talk about oxidative phosphorylation, is when we have a lot of ATP, you have very little oxidative phosphorylation. That's okay, all right, but it affects everything. And we'll see how that plays in. So in, in, in a sense, having a lot of ATP, not a problem. But once you've got all the ATP that you've got room for, because you only have a fixed amount of ADP, what are you going to do with the rest of that energy? You don't want to just burn it and lose it. So that's, that's where it becomes an issue. OK? All right, um, and that's what happens. So if we look about this and we were to summarize this figure, we say high energy is going to stop this cycle. High energy as measured by ATP. And NADH is going to stop this cycle. Because when we have high NADH, we have low NAD. And low NAD is a problem. Okay? So those two things combined will stop the cycle. And either one of those, I should, I, I should say, well, more importantly, NAD. Lack of NAD is going to stop the cycle. All right. Now, this figure isn't here again to just throw some complexity at you, but rather to show you the relationship of this cycle to other cycles of the body. We call this a central metabolic pathway because it has connections and ties to many other things. What did I say about metabolic pathways last term when I introduced them? Maybe remember a, a, a cautionary guide I gave you about metabolic pathways being imaginary? What did I say about them? They're man-made inventions. Okay, They're man-made inventions because we look at them in isolation, but in fact they're not isolation because intermediates in those cycles are intermediates in other cycles as well. Okay. So we look at this and we think the citric acid cycle is over here, and fatty acid oxidation is over here, and amino acid metabolism is over here, but they're all occurring in the same place. Okay? They're not separate. And this, si this picture reminds us of that. It tells us that oxaloacetate can readily be made into aspartate, aspartic acid. Take the oxygen off, you put an amine on, bang, you've got aspartic acid. You take the amine off aspartic acid, replace it with oxygen, you've got oxaloacetate. Again, you have a way of getting energy into the cycle, or getting molecules into the cycle for energy from proteins. I've already told you about alpha ketoglutarate going to glutamic acid. Right here, this also goes back this way. Okay. Succinyl-CoA can be used to make heme, and in plants it can be used to make chlorophyll. Okay. Citrate turns out to be a very important molecule for regulating things, as we shall see later. It's also involved, uh, to a limited extent, in fatty acids and also in sterols. Okay? Now, the point of this is to show that, again, this is, this, these are interconnected. And when we have a pathway like this, we give it a name. It's called an anaplerotic pathway, A-N-A-P-L-E-R-O-T-I-C. Excuse me. Anaplerotic pathways. Anaplerotic, the word means literally to fill up. So if the, if the cell is low on glutamate, then excess alpha ketoglutarate will be used to fill up and replace that lost glutamate. If the citric acid cycle is needing more alpha ketoglutarate and it has plenty of glutamate, it's going to fill that up and make alpha ketoglutarate to keep the cycle going. Okay. So this exchange goes back and forth. 
I want you to keep this in mind because this will be important as we see the bigger picture in which metabolism occurs. Oxaloacetate, look at this guy right here, plays very important roles in these three pathways, citric acid cycle, amino acid metabolism, and you've already seen it in gluconeogenesis, a very, very important molecule, and it's involved in all three of these. Okay, you guys are looking a little tired and restless, and we haven't done a song yet this term, so I thought we might do a song. Is that a no? Okay, so this song uh, that I want to do is the only song I do during the class that was not written by me, okay? It was actually written by one of my students. Uh, she did a fantastic job on this song, and it's called Citrate Sonata. And uh, it's the only song I've ever seen that actually is about the citric acid cycle. I tried to write one and I couldn't do it. And so she did it and I said, damn you. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to do that first. But she wrote a really good song. It actually got published in a journal. Uh, and uh, it's called Citrate Sonata. It's to the tune of God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. And as always, if you don't sing loud with me, we don't sing anymore. So please join me. It goes. Our fats and carbs get broken down to acetyl-CoA. Exaloacetate combines in cycles TCA. The product of reaction 1-O-citrate is its name. Isocitrate, the product that ensues. Atoms got moved. Isocitrate is the product of step two. And oxidation soon occurs, reducing NAD. And alpha keto glutarate resulting from step three. From here we could make glutamate, that is if there's a need. Don't forget that we lost a CO2. Yes, it is true. In reaction three, we lost a CO2. So what's the point of all these steps? Well, let me tell you, friend. We use electron carriers in working towards our end of synthesizing ATP, a metabolic trend. Oxidize and then oxidize some more. Here in step four, acetoglutarate gets oxidized some more. The enzyme with cofactors 5, including TPP, lipoate, FAD, CoA, and also NAD. A succinyl that's on CoA is what gets made, you see. This reaction occurs so favorably, don't you agree? It's a good reaction energetically. With four more steps, we're halfway there, so let me summarize. When CoA's lost, we see that GTP is synthesized. The succinate that is produced will soon get oxidized. FAD goes to FADH2. What did we do? We made fumarate and FADH2. Add water, cross the double bond, and malate we create. With one last NAD, we can then dehydrogenate to give a final product of oxaloacetate. It's removed, and this lowers delta G. Oh, yes, indeed. It's through pulling that this last step can proceed. Cool song, huh? Her name is Tari Tan. Uh, Tari is currently uh, in the uh, neuroscience PhD program at Harvard University. So she had, in addition to good songwriting skills, she had some very good academic skills as well. Okay. And I think I've sort of talked about that there. Now, talking about citrate citric acid uh, cycle and metabolism leads us to uh, a very important um, consideration, okay? People have heard about arsenic and arsenic poisoning. Arsenic was in the news last uh, term about organisms that might be using that to uh, make DNA and similar molecules. Arsenic, arsenic in regular cells is a real problem, and the problem arises as you can see right here, okay? It's a problem because arsenic can combine, or this arsenite, as you see here, can combine readily with the lipoamide sulfhydryl groups. All right? 
If that happens, this guy right here takes lipoate out of the picture. And if you were to do this to all of your lipoate, what would happen to pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase? Well, those would immediately stop because they're necessary that's a necessary coenzyme for both of those reactions. If you stop the citric acid cycle in all of your cells, you will die. Okay? Just like we saw with the fluorocitrate being, uh, causing death in organisms, stopping the citric acid cycle causes a problem. Well, there is fortunately a, a rescue that can be done uh, if it's done quickly for a person who has suffered arsenic poisoning. And that involves the uh, addition of this molecule here, 2,3-dimercaptopropanol, or called BAL, which is probably the way that you'll remember it. BAL has the property that it will literally pull off that arsenite from the lipoamide and leave the lipoamide back in its original state. That has to happen fairly quickly if arsenic poisoning occurs. Okay? But fortunately, there is a treatment for that, and uh, the person can then go back to going through and doing the citric acid cycle. OK, now I've got about eight or nine minutes left. And the eight or nine minutes, we're going to get a brand new cycle, a brand new metabolic pathway. Well, it's not quite that bad. Okay, It's not quite that bad. So, the cycle I'm getting ready to tell you about is an interesting cycle. It's called the glyoxylate cycle. And no, I'm not going to go through a whole new metabolic uh, cycle for you in nine minutes. That wouldn't be fair. But it is a cycle that is uh, a cycle of its own. It just happens to use a lot of the reactions of the citric acid cycle. So we, I can think of it as sort of overlapping with the citric acid cycle. So glyoxylate cycle occurs only in plants bacteria and yeast. It does not occur in animals. Okay? So we don't have the glyoxylate cycle occurring in animals. In plants, bacteria, and yeast, however, they have two enzymes that we don't have. This is why they're able to do this cycle. Okay? Two enzymes. One enzyme is called isocitrate lyase. That's different from isocitrate dehydrogenase, which we, had, we talked about before. And isocitrate lyase catalyzes a reaction in which isocitrate is converted into succinate and glyoxylate. This is where the cycle gets its name. So isocitrate lyase, we don't have this enzyme. We can't do this reaction. Bacteria, yeast can do this. Well, now they've got this molecule glyoxylate. What are they going to do with glyoxylate? It turns out that if they take glyoxylate and combine it with another acetyl-CoA, they make malate. OK? Everybody with me so far? Now, the significance here is a very important one. In us, all we can do when we get to the isocitrate point is we, do th we go through two decarboxylations. We lose two CO2s. We go from a six-carbon molecule to a four-carbon molecule. And then we regenerate oxaloacetate. So what did we do in our cycle? We started with a four-carbon intermediate oxaloacetate. We added two carbons from acetyl-CoA. We oxidized two carbons. And we're right back where we were. We've, we've added two carbons. We've lost two carbons, right? Plants and bacteria have this option, OK? Now, for the moment, we don't need to worry about when do they do glyoxylate cycle, when do they do citric acid cycle. It turns out they actually do both. Okay? But they have the option of taking isocitrate, pulling off four carbons, but keeping those other two carbons to do something with. Okay? This glyoxylate is combined using the enzyme malate synthase. This is the second enzyme that we don't have. Malate synthase catalyzes the formation of malate, and malate converts into oxaloacetate by the malate dehydrogenase, just that same enzyme from the citric acid cycle. Now, think about what, the, what this means. This means, then, that when we turn this cycle, one time we produce an oxaloacetate, right? That's no different from us, except for we've got this guy sitting over here, right? What is this guy going to be used to do? Make another oxaloacetate. 
All right, so when we turn our cycle, we start with one oxaloacetate, we end up with one oxaloacetate, right? When we do this cycle, we start with one oxaloacetate, we oxidize this over here, we end, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, we oxidize succinate, we end up with two oxaloacetates. So the glyoxylate cycle gives two oxaloacetates per turn of the cycle. Now that has significance for us, just a second, that has significance for those plants and bacteria because each time they turn the cycle they're generating an extra oxaloacetate. And what is oxaloacetate good for? Making glucose. Biosynthesis is exactly right. Okay, It's good for making glucose. We can't convert oxaloacetate from the, our cycle into glucose because what happens if we do that? We stop the citric acid cycle, right? But each time this thing turns, it spits off another one, and that can be used to make glucose. That means then, this will be the last thought of the day, and then we'll, we'll, we'll call it a, a day. That means then that plants, bacteria, and yeast can convert acetyl-CoA into glucose. We cannot do that. Because they've used two acetyl-CoA's to make an oxaloacetate, and that oxaloacetate is used to make glucose, they can therefore convert acetyl-CoA into glucose. Now that has importance. If I could convert my oxaloacetate, in, if I could convert my acetyl-CoA's into glucose, I wouldn't have to spend so much time thinking about this guy, my New Year's resolution I'm walking around with. Okay? Because I'd convert that acetyl-CoA from breakdown of fat into glucose that I can burn very easily with running, bang, I'm thin. There's the project I want you guys to solve by next time, okay? <laughs> All right, see you on Friday. And I'll talk more about this on Friday also. on this side. I'm sorry? What is there no regulation on this side? There, well what can then